All right. I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, so again, thank you for everybody for joining today's webinar. Um, the new style of IT networking is here, presented by Tom Williams, SCN Strategy and Execution, America's HP Networking. So first, I'd like to take a few minutes to go through some housekeeping items during the webinar. Everyone, the conference has been unmuted. Oh, one second. A little technical difficulty. The conference has been muted. Okay, sorry about that. All right, so um, first I'm just going to take some a few minutes to go through the housekeeping items. During today's webinar, everyone's phones will be muted, as you just heard. If you have any questions, please enter them into the chat box, and we will answer them during the question and answer portion of the webinar. So all right, let's get started. So first, I'd just like to take a few minutes to um, go over Avnet Academy and what we are all about. For over 25 years, Avnet has been helping customers realize the value of technology training through major systems implementation, integration, and development. When you choose Avnet Academy as your training provider, you get instructors with real-world experience. So many of our instructors have experience deploying software and hardware solutions in complex environments. So you don't have to settle for instructors whose only experience with these products is in the classroom. Abnet Academy has also built a large network of partners and in-house talent to build a premier training organization. Through our partner network, we are able to offer you quality, flexibility, and customized training options to fit your needs. If you choose private on-site training for your group, we can customize the curriculum and classes based on your needs and the current skills of your staff. Avnet Academy has a presence in countries all over the world. That means you can enjoy benefits like using Avnet training credits in different countries or have one education contact who can coordinate training for your employees around the world. Earlier this year, we were actually named an HP Learning Partner, which enables us to equip you with authorized HP Expert One certification training. You can visit academy.avnet.com to view our listing of HP offerings, which does include um, a training course called Creating HP Software Defined Networks, um, which Tom will talk about a little bit later in the presentation. We also offer several training delivery options so you can get your training your way. You can choose to learn from the comfort of your own home or office. We have public classes so you would participate in a classroom or it's offered virtually. Uh, we have private classes offered at a customer site or at one of our training facilities. And we also have self-paced e-learning with hands-on labs and office hours. So you can take those courses at your own pace. Again, please visit academy.avnet.com to view our public schedule and book your next HP course. And Tom, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you. I'm assuming everybody can hear me okay, so I'll just start moving through the slide. And uh, I'd like to thank you for making the time today to listen a little bit about SDN. My job for HP is to spend a, a large amount of my time in front of customers and partners who are looking to understand what is the reality of SDN today, uh, what are the, the, the reasons to deploy it, maybe what are some of the reasons to hold off, when does it make sense, and I want to go through a lot of that. So maybe this will be a little bit more about talking about what is still hype and what's reality and maybe reduce and, and remove some of the confusion that, that you may have in your heads as well. So uh, with that, I have my contact information at the end if you want to reach out and this is, this is valuable to you and I'll be more than happy to talk to you more about this. Um, but I do want to sprinkle through this kind of what other customers are doing with SDN, maybe get in your minds some, some things that are possible. Um, to steal from maybe some of the other marketing schemes from other companies around the world to talk about, uh, you know, what would you like to do today is, is, is sort of the mentality. Because SDN comes with some pre-packaged and pre-shrunk sort of shrink-wrapped solutions, but it also comes with this ability to have a toolbox. And uh, with that, customers and partners alike can, can start building things and employees can build things and kind of chain things together, what they want to happen in their network, where we haven't really been able to do that before. And if we have been able to do that before, it's usually you have to do it within a particular vendor's product. 
So what we have here is the ability to maybe chain some things together across multiple vendors' products. And hopefully that will get clear as I move through here. So let's start with the first slide you're seeing here. Although I represent HP networking, I realize networking is part of a bigger piece, certainly with inside of HP and also within the industry and, and as you folks build out your networks. But as I, as I come to you from a networking perspective and play my position for HP, uh, I, I need to articulate that we're also trying to, under, uh, trying to respond to the greater trends that are going on in the industry. And so while networking is nice, it actually implies that there's also a fair amount of server and storage and client activity that comes with that. And some of the trends over on the right, uh, I'll cover and some I won't, but I won't cover big data as that's probably its, whole, its own presentation. But as we talk to customers, and, and I'm sure you folks are very much in the same boat, if your employees walk in and they have their own wireless devices, their own handheld devices, so the company's decision is how much of my information as a company do I make available to my employees on their handhelds and on their, you know, call it BYOD. And with that mobility comes the challenge of securing that data and what do I do by allowing it out to my employees out on their, onto their handhelds, but then also what am I going to do about security, about making sure that that stays within the walls of the company. At the same time, if we look inside the network in toward the data center, many of us are having conversations of you know, what sort of applications do we want to keep on premise that we have the expertise to continue supporting and running, which ones are important to us that we want to deploy, but you know, we want to pay somebody else to do that because either they have the expertise to do it or it isn't that critical that we have the application on our site. We just need to have access to the, the mechanisms for it. And so those cloud-based applications tend to move our data and our applications outside of our data center. So much like mobility out on the client side moves our data and has security implications because we're moving beyond the traditional walls and boundaries of our network, same thing happens on the cloud side. We're moving some of our application and data potentially out to managed providers, and so the security implications there are just as needed and need to be just as robust, if not more. So these are the forces that are, that are coming at us, uh, coming at all of you. You have to plan for this innovation in your network. I'm sure you're all continually hammered on, you know, how can we get this stuff rolled out faster. Um, in, in networking, I, the continuing mantra is always going to be doing more with less. I'm not sure we're the only industry like that, but I, I, I've yet to hear that we can do less with more. I, I'm not sure we'll ever hear that spoken in our industry. So how do we continue to move forward in that? with that theme hanging over our heads. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do is maybe move a little bit further down into SDN and talk about some of the analogies. And hopefully these will make sense to you because when I was first moving into SDN a number of years ago, um, there were a lot of things that seemed analogous to me, things that were outside of technology. So uh, they were helpful to me um, when I try to explain it at home. Uh, to, to my wife and kids, is, these are the analogies I use, and they seem to understand, so hopefully they'll work for you if you're not well-versed in SDN yet. So if, if we go back days of old in the server world, what we would do, uh, if, if you wanted to buy an application, you'd, you'd buy something, you'd determine what application was going to work in your network, and then you would go choose all the, you know, put an RFP out, choose the right vendor, and go ahead and make the purchase. And typically in that environment with those applications, that application would come bound to an existing server and an operating system. And for an example of that, right, which doesn't exist anymore, if you think back to the days of Novell, Novell was very big in the enterprise space and they sold applications, but it came bound with their operating system, the Novell operating system, and then the hardware was typically bound with it as well. Well, you'd have to go to a museum nowadays to actually see that sort of thing. But when we look at networking, that's exactly how we continue to still purchase. Uh, you folks decide what's important in your network. You pick the features that you want, put out an RFI, an RFP, make the vendors jump through their hoops, and at the end of the day, you pick a solution that has applications that support what you're trying to do in networking. And what comes with it is an operating system and some hardware that's bound with it. So we got to enjoy the benefits of virtualization over in the server world and kind of, you know, disassemble everything and kind of go purchase the best in class of all the different products. Yet in networking, we haven't really enjoyed that. So when people start asking about SDN, I say at the basic level, just think of, think of servers and what happened there. And it's very similar to what's coming to visit networking. Now in the middle, what we have is a picture here of, of kind of how that plays out. So I, 
I can go take a basic box. I can go to buy one on Amazon or go to eBay or go to Best Buy or something like that and buy this basic switch uh, off the shelf and go pay for it for you know, 70 bucks at the register. And if it supports an open protocol for SDN, which in the open protocol is called OpenFlow, then I can send commands to it through a centralized control plane. And I'll kind of explain that as well. And then, and then I would assign applications to it. So I could sit there and say, you know, I bought this $70 switch at the store. It supports this protocol. And I want to I wanna make it route between two ports. And the switch was never built to do that. The manufacturer never designed it to build that, to do that. <clears throat> Yet I have the ability with OpenFlow to sit there and say, I want these two ports side by side to actually route to one another, and they'll be two separate subnetworks. That's what the beauty of SDN as software-defined networking it brings to this, this um, network infrastructure. I have the ability to take networking functions and push them out into places where I need them. So I don't need to go out and buy, in this, if I follow this example, I don't need to go buy a Layer 3 routed capable switch and go buy that everywhere. In an SDN model, what I can do is buy an OpenFlow capable switch that can take commands and then I can put routing into various parts of my network where it's needed instead of having to buy it and put it everywhere. The analogy I use is in my living room. Um, you know, when I, when I would go on trips and call home and ask how everything was going the day I was gone, uh, my wife would tell me that my son had some friends over, they were doing some homework, and they took a break, and they went into the living room and tried to watch a movie, and oh my gosh, there's six remotes in there, and they could get the picture, but the sound didn't work, and and it sounded like they felt that they had broken the living room when, in fact, they hadn't. There was just all these keys you had to hit in the right order to get anything to work correctly. So what do I do, right? I go out and buy a, a, a magic remote, and I, I program it, and it has all the different vendors' products in there. And now I can just hit a button to, say, flip over to Netflix or record this show or what have you, and it'll do it over and over and over again. And what the remote is doing is sending the command set to each vendor's box that it needs to see to do the function to support the overall solution that I'm trying to get to. So if the overall solution is flip over to Blu-ray and play this disc, then the remote obviously sends the commands associated with each vendor's box that that vendor needs to see. So that they play a part in the, in the whole process. So SDN, in my mind, is very similar. I, need a, I want a magic remote somewhere, and we'll, then we'll remove the magic from this at some point, but I want a magic remote where I can push a button and something happens over and over and over again, and I can do it across multiple vendors' products, and it sends it in a command set that that vendor understands so that it can do its part to, to support the overall goal of what I'm trying to accomplish. So with that in mind, I wanted to kind of plant in your mind some of the seeds, and I realize you all probably come from various markets and segments in the industry, so this may or may not touch all of you, but I'll cover it as well. Um, this is what some of our other customers are doing with this. And so this is meant to maybe create some uh, creative juices for you and some ideas, and maybe it's applicable to what you're already doing today. So in a school district, for instance, specifically K through 12, not at the higher ed space, we are working with uh, K through 12 districts who want to prioritize common core testing or you know, what it used to be called no child left behind testing. So that, I'll give you an example, so that, um, you know, the third week of May, I want to have testing occur across the entire district, and I want it to occur for only the ninth graders. And on that given day for the ninth graders, I want that to be one of the most important things that goes across my network because I need to make sure that our district conforms to the standardized testing. But I don't want to stop everything else. I want the 10th graders, 11th graders, teachers, everybody else to have access. So in this case, I could sit there and say, ninth graders, you're only going to see Pearson.com for testing. 10th, 11th, 12th teachers, you're all going to be able to go to YouTube and do things for testing and other things outside of standardized testing. So can I do that in such a way that I, I push that magic button and the network automatically does all these reconfigurations for me and at the end of the week stops doing that? So we're doing that with some school districts now. Um, so if you happen to be in a school district, I'd love to talk to you about it. It's a, it's a pretty cool little feature. And then if we move the second button here is actually higher ed. Uh, we, universities over the past couple of years have really struggled with the fact, that, especially if they're land grant universities with dormitory systems, um, they have kind of a twofold problem. They have 
folks like my kids who come into college with their Xbox or PS, PS4s and they expect to play their games inside the dormitories, and or, or my daughter who uh, watches seems to watch a fair amount of Netflix while she's in college, um, you know, surprisingly or maybe not surprisingly in the universities, upwards of 90% of the dormitory traffic is Netflix. So my kids sit there and complain about how they're not able to connect to the school servers and turn in their homework and all the other things. And they're both at different schools and under different vendors' products and all that. It's just it's just the the nature of the beast that they're at with universities. Universities are struggling with how do they provide the services that they're supposed to provide while, in fact, still allowing for the students to have their recreational time as well. So universities are looking at this. Can I time shift some of these recreational things? Can I maybe... Uh, charge back to a student for room and board, specifically for board, so that I can help build out a special network for this? <clears throat> can I prepare for the fact when Apple does an iOS update on a, a campus of 40,000 students that I may have 30,000 devices that suddenly take an Apple download over a one or two week period and I'm, I'm congested with all of these Apple updates? So there's there's some interesting solutions that we have in the education space. Uh, we're also working in the healthcare space about how to incorporate you know, patient readings on my smartphone, whether it be diabetes or other things. Like, I need to get this data into the network, but due to HIPAA compliance, I certainly need to make sure that it, it remains you know, with its walls around it and, and nowhere it can't traverse through the network, and, and I need to make sure that I'm complying with all the requirements and regulations I have to do. But I, I do want to offer mobile applications to my patients because I want to retain them and bring them back and, and personalize their service. If I move down to the fourth button in the retail space, as I walk, as I leave my house and I drive to a mall, um, my phone is probably still has wireless on because I was using it in the house that way. And I'm, I don't turn it off when I'm in the mall, but I'm beaconing in the mall. My wireless is looking for a wireless AP to attach to. Stores know this. Stores have the ability to know that I'm in there. So let's let's pick an example. Let's say I go to the Apple store. I've purchased a product from them. They know it in my purchase history. Maybe I've opted in to receive their mailings as well. They can see in the store that my phone is there. I'm not connected to their network, um, but you know, kind of in the big brotherish aspects, we are radiating everywhere we go, just about. But, you know, with a little bit of software in the background, Apple could easily recognize that I'm in the store and offer me a discount while I'm in there today and sit there and say, Tom, thanks for your purchases. You're, you're a trusted customer, an honored customer. We'd like to give you 50% off on accessories while you're in here. So the retail space is very interested in knowing some things that it can do with SDN based upon wireless technology. Um, as I look into some of the other things down here, in the general space of route, around routing, we start putting open flow capabilities, this SDN protocol, into our routers. And I start picking up some capabilities across the WAN that are pretty exciting. I can now route traffic to and from devices to firewalls, away from Wi-Fi, to load balancers, based upon governance or requirements, um, obligations that I have. <clears throat> and then a really interesting one, when the whole SDN uh, standard started, Google, which is 100% deployed on SDN, came into the group and showed everybody that they can communicate between their data centers uh, across their wide area links, and they had increased their WAN band length from 40% up to 95%, and the graphic is a little messed up in this picture, but that number is 95%. And they did this only through SDN. They didn't actually go in and buy more bandwidth for their wide area networks. So while it isn't as glitzy or shiny as, as maybe some of the other applications, this one has great financial impact for our customers who are sitting there saying, I need more WAN bandwidth. It isn't in the budget. Is there a way that I can more effectively manage my WAN bandwidth? And with OpenFlow-enabled routers, the possibilities there as well. So I want to come out of the living room analogy and give you a different analogy that also seems to work as well. So if you think of an emergency vehicle going through your town, so typically a, uh, an ambulance, it's going to have a strobe on the top of the vehicle, and it's going to strobe the intersection as it comes up to it and turn the light green and go through the intersection quickly, and the rest of us you know, sit there and go through the cycles afterwards. I would offer that that's really where networking is today. What I do is I go into my network and I decide what are the ambulances. It's probably video conferencing or maybe this session here or what have you. Um, maybe it's my data 
deduplication or what you know what data backup or point of sale information, whatever my ambulance has. Uh, then I go into my boxes and I create access lists or some other commands that associated with that vendor. And I say this is what an ambulance looks like. When you see it, make it go through the box very quickly. And then I go visit every box in my network and make sure that they all have that same command set. Now there's some tools that allow me to do that in batch fashion, but I still have to go visit every one of these boxes. I would offer that in networking, that's pretty much how we do it. We do it just like the, the, the ambulance system does it today. Now if I take that same example and say, well, well, how would SDM make that different? It would be different if I called 911 and said, hey, you know, my father's having a heart attack, can you guys get an ambulance here? Probably wouldn't say it as calmly as that, but you know, get an ambulance here. And, and in this case, in the SDM world, 911 would pre-program the intersections before the ambulance ever rolled. And when the ambulance got to my house, 911 in this case would unprogram the intersections. So in an SDN world, the analogy is that there are applications who are about to kick off in the network, whether it be this video conference or a phone call or anything else. And as they're about to kick off, the network has the ability to be programmed in advance of that going on. And then when that event ends, so when we finish this conversation at the end of the session, then the, pro the network deprograms the whole thing. So SDN has that as a concept as well. Let me give you an example of one of the SDN applications that HP makes, and I'll talk about how all the applications come to play. So if I, if I pick on that school again, my, I'll say that my son is in the upper right corner of that picture on the bottom there, and he's, he's got a URL that a friend has given him, and he's going to go try to find it on the school network because he's got time to do that. At the same time, he texts it to all of his friends, and they keep texting it on and on and on. What happens in a traditional environment is, is my son's uh, attempt will come into the network, it'll go through the entire district, it'll come back to the data center, it'll visit a firewall, and the firewall will make the ultimate decision whether that packet is allowed to go through or not. And typically it'll be you know, rejected if it's a bad place to go and that the administrators know about it. Well, that doesn't stop the fact that my son has texted everybody and they're texting everybody, so now everybody's trying to go to this same website because they haven't seen the negative response yet. And so the fire, what we do is we end up building bigger firewalls because they're going to handle the volume of traffic coming at them, kind of making the same decision over and over and over again. Well, there's an application that HP makes called uh, Protector, which in this case is um, a security application that takes that same scenario. So when my son comes in, goes to the firewall, and the firewall says no, what happens is that magic remote, the SDN controller in this case, sends a command out to all the boxes that support OpenFlow and says, hey, when you see this particular type of ambulance, which is one that we don't want to let go through the network, um, I want you to throw it on the floor. So the firewalls made the same decision, but in this case, the SDN controller noted the decision and then put, the, put a programming change out across the entire network, said if you see this come in again anywhere, stop it. Don't even let it come in. So now what we've done is we've affected a firewall change out at the edge in switches that were probably never built to be firewalls, but now they're throwing away packets because somebody told them to do that. And now we're not revisiting the firewall over and over and over again. So SDN, while this is a very simple application, SDN changes the balance and the economies of how we buy our networks. So instead of me buying large firewalls, for instance, in the core of my network under an SDN architecture, I still have firewalls in the core of my network, but now what I do is I, I move some of that functionality out to the edge of the network. So I want to move forward here a little bit and talk about the special app that we have in the higher ed space. So what we also have done with this protector application is we have built uh, a prioritized DNS uh, function. Like I mentioned at the start of the presentation, what I was showing was the ability to prioritize testing over everything else that anybody would do. And so in this app, what we have in uh, let me look at the presentation here. What we have on the on the bottom right is a VLAN of probably a bunch of students in this case that we want to treat and say that everything that they do is going to be prioritized. And over on the left side, maybe we have some other VLANs that aren't going to be as, as treated. We're not going to treat them with high priority. So let's say the ninth graders are on the right, 10th, 11th, 12th, and the administrators are on the left and the teachers. What I'm going to do with the 
uh, network protector SDN app on the top left is have communication to all my boxes, both wired and wireless. And I'm going to allow the traffic to come through on the left side from the teachers and such. But over on the right, where I have treated VLAN traffic, um, I'm actually going to give them priority to get through to testing, and then I'm also going to stop things. The additional piece of all this, there's, a, there's some diagonal text there called uh, OpenFlow DSCP tagging. This is mo probably the most critical piece. If I have OpenFlow enabled switches and wireless APs out on the edge here, what I'm doing is I'm classifying and acting upon traffic at that location. But as I send it into the core of the network, I'm also tagging it with what they call the diff serve control point, DSCP tagging. And what that allows me to do is take that traffic and overlay it and put it into an existing network. So when, when I talk to customers such as yourself, what I say to them is this is not an all or nothing proposition. This isn't rip and replace everything you've got to put in OpenFlow. This is the next time you do an edge refresh, which we typically do every three to five years, next time you do an edge refresh, put in boxes on the edge that are capable of supporting OpenFlow. And in the HP's case, and this isn't the case for everybody, but in HP's case, I also have the ability to map those to existing quality of service metrics that you probably have in your core, whether it be built out on Cisco or Brocade or Juniper or, any, or even HP. Any of the other ones, I can map into those. So with an edge refresh, I'm able to in, embrace some of the SDN applications that are coming and map it into my existing core and then go visit the core later on with you know next year's money or the year after or whenever we do cores which are typically five to seven years although now that's stretching out to about ten years. So what's nice about these edge devices at least in the HP world and what I want to kind of emphasize here in the difference for HP is our, all of our boxes that we support OpenFlow on are actually hybrid boxes. So what that means is it runs the existing operating system that we've built in, and that could be Comware, it could be ProVision, depending on which box you have in there. But it also runs OpenFlow. So it runs essentially two protocols, either ProVision and OpenFlow, or Comware and OpenFlow. And so what that allows the box to do is, say you do an edge refresh this year and you put in HP boxes, it allows based on Comware and ProVision to exist in your existing network, work with, work with your existing vendors, and interoperate in the network that you have today. But because it's also supporting OpenFlow, it's also listening for when you turn on your first SDN application, and it will respond to that. And then two years down the road, you have 10 SDN applications, and it will go ahead and respond to those. And so over time, this allows for an evolution into SDN and a transition into SDN as opposed to having to, to make a, a rip and replace sort of uh, decision to get this done. <clears throat> so what I'd like to do at this point, and I'm in the background here firing up my, my browser, is show you another little demo of what goes on with a, a different application for HP. So this is going to be in the presentation that the handout that you get. So you'll see the YouTube video here, and you can search for it if you can't remember the actual link and get to it. But let me share my entire desktop here. Actually, let me share Firefox. And then I'll kick off this demo. And I'll move it forward a little bit so that we can get to the demo. So what we have here, as you're watching it, is a link demonstration. And, and I don't know if it's large enough for you to see it, but on the top left we have the presenter, somebody who's showing their presentation, much like what I'm doing here. And they're going to run a movie in the background to chew up some of the bandwidth. And they're trying to show it to the person on the bottom left. So the top one's James, bottom one's Mary for this case. <clears throat> and what we'll see, what we're really interested in though is the desktop sharing and the PowerPoint sharing that's about to kick off. So the top presenter is actually going to kick off a PowerPoint, much like what I'm showing with you. And I want you to obviously see the, the lag that it's associated with this. So we've already seen the presentation up. We see the presentation slowly building for the, the person who's receiving it. And then as the user flips through the slides, this is an experience that we're all used to. I know that even when I flip my slides in this presentation that there's some lag associated as to when it's going to actually show up on your desktops. 
And this is the world that we live in in desktop sharing. This isn't a link problem. It isn't a WebEx problem, uh, Citrix problem. It, we all have these. It's the propagation delay, and it's that the network isn't necessarily tuned for what's going on. Well, over on the right, I want to show you a window. We're going to click on a mouse that just occurred, and a red disabled went to green enabled. And this is the interface to this application. If we look back over on the left, and we look at those slides, and notice now the propagation delay between those two slides is, is pretty, pretty great. Um, or the, the propagation delay between those two is actually not very great, and, and they're synchronized very well. So this application is actually around QoS. Now I'm going to see if I can stop sharing here and return back to my conference. It looks like I can. Now, let me show you what happened in the background on this. So there was really no magic going on. <clears throat> but what happened in the background on this is on the bottom left, we had James connected into his switch. And Linda was over on her switch over on the right. I thought it was, yeah. And so they're coming through a campus network here. And what happened is James double-clicked and talked to the link server up in the, in the data center. And there was an API that Microsoft wrote that announced that on this link session that James has this port number, this random port number, and that Linda has this random port number. And over on our application, what we call Network Optimizer, we noticed those port numbers and we sent it into the SDN controller. And the SDN controller sends some green arrows back to those open flow switches and says, hey, where James is coming in and where Linda is coming in, I want you to prioritize those ports. And not just those physical ports. I actually want to prioritize down to the logical ports that are in there. Because you know James may actually be coming in on uh, multiple device or with multiple other users from a downstream switch of some sort. So I actually need to get James's address, but also his logical connection, and elevate his quality of service. So that's all that happened in the background. Now, much like the previous application I showed you, which was called Protector, which was that security application, we have the ability over in the kind of the middle right there to modify the quality of service diff serve control point rules again. So even though I'm going into those switches and I'm modifying the quality of service on these open flow switches, they still are marking the packets appropriately for me to put it into a core network that may not be open flow. In fact, maybe kind of the legacy stuff that we're all that we've all deployed today. So this is, this is an example of an application making a call. And what you saw in the previous demo was somebody actually clicking a mouse to make that happen. When in reality, what happens with this application, and we just did that to kind of delineate the demo, what really happens in this application is Link automatically says, hey, I'm about to kick off a session. And much like that 911 example, it automatically programs the intersections and programs these switches to carry forward. Now, this may be exciting in a LAN environment, but I think it gets even more exciting if we, if we talk about moving James and Mary around a little bit, because now if we put James on maybe the end of a, a wireless link where the bandwidth's a little bit more constrained, and then put Mary out on the other end of a wide area link on a router, um, th things get a little bit more interesting and, and a little bit more appropriate, I think. Because in this case, I do want to I do want to alter quality of service through these limited pipes, through my wireless pipes and through my wide area pipes. And this is really where the power of something like this takes on, uh, really takes off and, and becomes impressive. Now, what's really nice about this is again there isn't human intervention. Microsoft has defined what the template looks like for a quality call in Link. And all we are doing with the controller, with that magic remote, is applying that template on the network every time a call occurs, and then removing the template when the call is over. So there isn't human intervention. It's just every time a call is set up, we apply it. Every time the call hangs up, we remove it. And so there's a, there's a dynamic aspect to this and a fluid aspect to this that occurs. One other application that I want to make you aware of that is just coming out, we're coming out of beta on it, is called Network Visualizer. And if you're familiar with Wireshark applications, you'll be familiar with this. So typically in a networking environment, if I'm responsible for providing backbone services, I, I may not know what my users are completely running all the time in their buildings or off in their, in their networks. And so what I have to do is kind of take a snapshot or copy everything from their port over to a packet inspection engine to see what's going on. And that same function needs to be provided in SDN 
So we do the same thing. I'm able to go, you know, go choose four ports. I'm going to go get a couple servers and a couple users, and I'm going to try to figure out what they're doing and how much bandwidth they consume, and they sit out at some building somewhere else. I'm going to take a portion of those four ports, some very specific traffic that I'm looking for, and have that brought back to a device that is a packet inspection engine. And so this isn't necessarily an HP cell position. I'm not here trying to sell you packet inspections, although parts of our company make them. This is to, like that firewall, this is to reuse what we've already built. So if there's already packet inspection capabilities in your network, in an SDN world, you still want to be able to use those and you want to funnel traffic back to that device and be able to look at that traffic, play it over and over again, figure out what the rules are that you want to apply. You know, do you want to allow that into your backbone? Do you want to throttle it? Do you want to completely blacklist it and not let it occur? And so this is another application, Network Visualizer, that we are supporting under SDN as well. So all of the products get supported and all the software comes in based upon an architecture that HP has built. And so on the bottom left are kind of the hardware pieces. If I look across about 50 switches that HP makes, there's about 20, a little bit more than 25 million ports out there of switches that are capable of doing SDN today. So if you've purchased HP's switching products, you would be able to download the additional code that would put OpenFlow on those switches, and that's a free download, and now your boxes are OpenFlow capable. And they are speaking the existing protocol, whether it be Comware or ProVision, but now also picking up OpenFlow. And uh, at least for the boxes I can talk about right now, uh, we have two wireless APs that are uh, on the verge of supporting OpenFlow as well. We're just coming out of beta on the code for that. It's in Comware 7. And Comware 7 is um, common to both the wireless APs and to the routers. So when that code comes out here in the next couple of weeks, then I will have OpenFlow capabilities on the two wireless APs that HP makes and then the routers that we make as well. Um, for the for the question that's probably out there around Aruba, Aruba makes uh, wireless APs and they do support OpenFlow. And just uh, by stroke of luck, their chipset is, uh, if not very similar, identical to the wireless chipsets that we're using as well. So this should be uh, a real easy integration should the, uh, should the merger and acquisition move forward. So on top of all that is the controller that controls all of these, the magic remote in this case. And that's a software download for us. You can download that today. You can get a 60-day trial on it for free. Uh, even if you chose to buy it, it's $495 list. And I think after um, Avnet uh, gets it to you and, and gets, gives you a good price, you guys will be you know, probably in the, I guess, probably $300 range, if I had to guess, if not lower. And so that gets loaded onto a server, uh, a virtual machine of your, uh, that are, is already available, and it just runs on Ubuntu, which is also free. And then the applications get loaded on top. So that application around the security that I showed you or the quality of service, um, or the, the visualizer being able to pull traffic in, those are applications get loaded on top. And how we do that is we actually have created a software developer's kit. At the same time, it's also free and free to download. And we're making sure that the other vendors in the industry have access to this developer's kit so that they can build the applications that are going to ride on top of this network. And so how that manifests itself is we put those all into an app store. So much like you're used to on your, your, your phones with either iTunes or Google Play, you go there and you download an app. And if you don't like that app and you've got another one in the same family, you download a different app and see if you like that one better. Same sort of concept here. We have apps that have been developed by HP, so the three that I've talked about, the security, the quality of service, and the, and the uh, visualizer one. And then there are ones that we've built with partners and we know that they, those work because we built them uh, in conjunction. And then we also have a section, which, and those two are kind of like the Apple iTunes version of vetted applications. Then we have this third version of community developed, which is kind of the Google method of coming to market, where community uh, folks can build their, out their apps. And that's where a lot of the innovation is going to come from. And as those grow in popularity and, and size, those potentially move into partner developed or or even HP sponsored at some point. But we want to make sure that the community environment is thriving as well. And then we take all those applications and break them down by functionality, whether you want to optimize or, or uh, provision. And so we put them in functionality buckets as well. So when you, go to the, when, you, when you download the controller and you put that into an available Ubuntu machine, then you just point it at the App Store here and download apps. 
And the reason I say it's much like iTunes or Google Play is, for instance, we already have two load balancing applications that are out on the App Store. So over time, there's going to be multiple ways of doing very similar tasks, and you will choose the apps that work best in your environment across the hardware that you've chosen that works best in your environment. Because I, I want to come back to that analogy I use of my living room. If I have a magic remote that speaks a language to everything in my living room, and my television breaks two years from now, I'm not really beholden to the vendor that I have for my television currently when I replace it with a new television. Because I really just need it to work with my remote. I need it to, you know, it fits in the living room. It has the picture quality I want. The same thing happens in an SDN world. If you choose HP's switches and put them in your network, and let's say 10 years down the road HP makes a, a decision and, I don't know, gets out of the networking business or somehow messes it up, you know what? There are so many vendors supporting OpenFlow that you're able to make that transition to and from vendors that support OpenFlow. Or you don't like your current firewall vendor. You're able to move over to a different firewall vendor. So SDN is exciting to some vendors in the market. It's also very threatening, obviously, to some vendors in the market. So you, you may get different water temperature when you talk to your vendor about SDN and, hey, do you support OpenFlow in these boxes, depending on how how much of a uh, perceived revenue generator it can be for them, or how much of a perceived threat it can be for them. And just to let you know that you're not the only ones uh, contemplating SDN if you decide to go down the path, um, <clears throat> these are customers who have deployed SDN, and not, not in a trivial way. These aren't folks who went out and bought one or two switches and put a controller in and turned on an application and went. You know, the example I'm looking at here, South Washington uh, County Schools, that's a, uh, a district up in Minnesota that has uh, about 400 Ethernet switches. It's got about 1,800 wireless APs, and they're using the protector app that you saw, the one where I can stop things around the edge. Um, it used to, and, and the number of devices they have, or number of users they have to support is typically around uh, 15,000 know, students and teachers and everything else, up to 20,000. Uh, but sometimes they balloon up to 30 based upon what's going on around the district, you know, school uh, sport events and things like that where parents are on campus using the wireless and such. So they can't control the devices that are coming in, but in this case where there's upwards of 30,000 devices attaching across 400 switches and 1,800 wireless APs, there is one person managing the security posture of this entire district, and they're able to do it very easily. Um, and, and their quote back to us is that they're stopping 50,000 malware hits per day. And so the guy comes back, looks at his computer at the end of the day, and goes, yep, I'm, I'm where I need to be. I'm still safe. Everything's still running well. Whereas before, it took a staff of people. It took a large budget to maintain the updates on all the malware and the viruses and everything else and being able to make sure all the boxes were configured right based across multiple vendors and just on and on and on. So SDN for this customer really does show a real good ROI or TCO in this case. And we're in the home stretch here and I wanted to show you some things real quick because when I'm, when I'm talking to you about SDN, I realize that when I say SDN, when I'm thinking I'm telling you versus what you think I'm telling you may be different. <clears throat> and the reason is, if you think back about eight or ten years ago when you talked about high-def movies on disc, your choices were HD, DVD, or Blu-ray. And now all we have is Blu-ray. Well, I'm here to report to you that there are actually three types of SDN right now. So as a customer, you're probably left wondering, well, how am I supposed to work this and what am I supposed to choose? Well, let me take you through a brief history of how we got here because it's kind of important and can help you navigate moving forward. So back in 2006, HP was working with Stanford, and Stanford really just wanted access to a switch and to take the guts out of it and make it programmable, and that was pretty much all it wanted to do. It was called Project Ethane. And so HP and, and Stanford continued working through that, and some folks at Stanford realized that they didn't have access to switches, at least physically manufactured switches, but they thought the concept was pretty cool to have a, a programmable switch that could maybe run on anybody's hardware. So a few of the Stanford folks jumped out and started a company called Nasira about a year later. Well, the work continued out at Stanford and HP to move forward. And in 2011, 
the first version of OpenFlow was standardized by the OpenFlow committee. So in 2011, we had a standard. And I just want to let you know that you know, SDM has been around for a while, even though it's really making noise over the past couple of years only. Um, and around that same time, around 2011, a little bit later, VMware, which is obviously a software company, and really doesn't want to get in the hardware game either, found Nasira's approach to be very attractive and, and fit well within their, the way they operate their business. So that VMware acquired Nasira for about a billion dollars back in 2012. Around the same time, a company called NCME was uh, created outside of Cisco by former Cisco people. So Cisco said, you know, we want you to go after this market, but we want you to do it outside of Cisco, and you can move much more quickly and more nimbly than we can. So NCME was formed in 2012 as well. And in 2013, Cisco you know, saw the writing on the wall on how big OpenFlow and, and SDN was becoming and brought NCME back in and rolled them back in. Um, and turn that into a product line called the Nexus 9000, if anybody's familiar with their product line. Well, so what we're left with now is that the SDN standards bodies have the SDN standard with OpenFlow as the protocol that is spoken between all the boxes. You have VMware's version of it, which they call NSX, and uses the protocol VXLAN. And then you have Cisco's version of it, which is called ACI, and they use a protocol called OpFlex. Now, the challenge is, as a customer, if you're going to choose one of these SDN solutions, and SDN, again, just to remind you, is meant to be open. I should be able to pull somebody else, somebody's stuff out and put somebody else's in and you know, make changes based on what I see as appropriate. If you, if you subscribe to some of these vendor solutions, it, it, this is about two weeks old, this, these are the numbers of other vendors' products that have interoperability agreements that work in that space. So if you're in VMware, you can put you know, 17 or so other vendors' products in there and, and probably have a pretty good coverage. And with Cisco, you get a bit more with 38. And on the SDN side, you get well, you get well north of 150. So just wanted you to be aware of that. Um, you know, SDN isn't just SDN. There are actually three versions of it. And to, to kind of help navigate with that, if, if you are a VMware shop, as an example right now, and you choose VMware's version of SDN, NSX, and that's what's in your network, you know you don't have to sit there and say, gosh, I can't connect to anything else, or if I choose HPs, I can't connect to anything else. We've actually spent millions of dollars working with VMware to uh, actually integrate our products. So if you're a VMware shop and the server people are in charge of your next uh, turn of the crank of the network, and what you're going to do for your updates, great. Go, go ahead with NSX. What happens is the server dictates what happens in the network, and they write it to that little box in the middle with a dotted line around it called an open virtual switch database. So they write the configuration into the database. And over on the right side of that, our SDN controller reads from there and makes sure that the network supports the configuration requests of NSX. So in this case, both the overlay of NSX and the underlay of HP's SDN network are working in unison and in conjunction. So that they're supporting either the quality of service or the security or whatever's whatever's being requested of the network. Conversely, the other side is true. A lot of customers come back and say, well, I have VMware, but I don't have just VMware. I have a bunch of other stuff too. So I, you know, I have KVM, I have Citrix, I have other things. So in those cases, SDN is the main controller of the network. We write to the database what the physical requests are of the network, what we'd like to do with QoS and security and such. And VMware has the ability to read from it and then make sure the servers and clients are supporting that orchestration and provisioning request as well. So we call that federation because it goes in both directions. So you are free to choose in your in your network and in your environment what makes sense. If you decide that NSX is the way to drive the next virtualized network for you, great, go do that. And we can make sure the network supports it. And if you decide SDN is the way you need to do it, or you want NSX to be integrated into that, we can make sure that, that occurs as well. So this tends to be a data center type solution. And I just want to be uh, fully you know, open on some of the other data center applications that we have as well. So we've talked a little bit about the campus stuff with the, the protector and the optimizer and the visualizer applications. Talked about VMware in the data center and being able to support NSX and their virtualization scheme. But as we move into the cloud and we start talking about potentially putting our data in multiple clouds, 
and being able to per, and, and kind of have that same mindset. Can in my living room, can I push a button and make it do what I want it to do regardless of what cloud infrastructure I've put this on, whether it be um, you know, Amazon or Rackspace or what have you. Can I, can I just make sure that my provisioning is done in a specific way that I understand and everything underneath and all the intricate details get taken care of? So we actually partner with Alcatel Lucent's division called Nuage to provide that capability. So it's what we call the distributed cloud networking. So this is not only when you've taken your applications and data and pushed it out to a cloud, but potentially pushed them out to multiple clouds and need to have a uniform and structured and standard way to actually move workloads around various clouds and to move them for performance concerns or what have you. So with that, I kind of want to wrap up on all the SDN piece, and I've moved this a little bit to data center and talked about some of the cloud pieces there. Those are full-on discussions in other areas, but I don't want to go down that path on this conversation. I want to turn it back to, to Jen and Avnet and see if there are any questions from you that I can answer. Great. Thanks so much, Tom. At this time, I'm going to unmute all the lines. Just one second here. The conference has been unmuted. And I did get a couple of questions. Um, oh, you know what? The conference has been muted. Sorry, I was getting some feedback. So um, if you have a question, please type it in the chat box. That's going to be the easiest way um, at this point. So let me ask a few questions that did come in. Um, what about white label switches? Oh, sorry. That's a great read the first part. How would proprietary or custom built applications be able to take advantage of SDN? And I so assume it's a, the it's second a good part question. is. Okay. Um, we, you know, a lot of customers sit there and say, well, I've, you know, maybe I've had a vendor build out in the healthcare space. Maybe I've had a vendor build out a very specific application that only they built, and it has all the interoperable pieces, and it's got SLAs associated with it. You know, how how can I take advantage of SDN? And what I tell those customers is, we we finally have an architecture that we can take these, and, you know, they're proprietary, they're they're purpose built you know, whatever you want to call it, but these applications that, which are mission critical, we can finally put them on an open and standards-based network. And now those applications, instead of having to build a specialized purpose-built network, we can actually take advantage of cost savings and put it on a, a general purpose network, but with hooks into an open and standard way of controlling that network, regardless of what vendors are chosen. So um, as, I, as I talk to the fo those folks, I say, this is a great time to have conversations with those application vendors that you've chosen to say, hey, we're thinking of moving into a direction of an open architecture where you'd have hooks into our network and make it do what you need it to do to ensure the service level of that application. And begin those conversations, and we'd love to be part of those conversations. I don't, I don't think it's it's anything that's uh, negative to the vendor other than it's, it's maybe an additional set of work that's going to be undertaken. But the amount of control that they're going to get back over the network by being able to control multiple vendors' products it should open up many markets for that vendor because now they no longer have to build on a specific vendor. They can build across many vendors' products. Good question. Great. And if I have deployed VMware ESX but don't plan on using VMware NSX, can I still use SDN? Yeah, so VMware's version of SDN is, is NSX, and so I, I would imagine a lot of folks, unless you're, unless you're really big on here, um, you're probably deployed with ESX, which is the standard, uh, standard VMware deployment, and that will absolutely work with SDN. So what we do without having to turn on NSX is we can pull those servers right into an SDN architecture. And if even at some point in the future you decide you wanted to do NSX, the boxes where we pull the, our, our top of rack switches where we connect those servers, they'll either pull the ESX in natively or they'll actually uh, bring the ESX in and then kind of translate it or encapsulate it to NSX and bring it into that architecture. So if the customer is to say, well, I'm ESX today, but you know, two years from now I end up being NSX, our boxes will behave properly today 
and then you can turn on those features when you if if you decide to roll to NSX a couple of years from now. So fully fully flexible and, and work in both directions. Excellent. And um, just so everybody is aware, we will be um, sending out the recording as a follow up to everyone. So yes, you will get a copy of um, this presentation. And then I have one more question that came in. Does the SDN controller integrate with HP's IMC management platform? Yes, it does. So um, you know, if you're already built out on HP with IMC and the single pane of glass methodology there, <clears throat> what we're doing with an SDN controller is we are setting up the network. We are allowing calls to occur. We're taking tearing calls down, things like that. But you still need a management tool that's going to manage what's going on in the network, troubleshoot what's going on in the network, and fix what's going on in the network. And that's where IMC really shines. So SDN, if I continue that, that uh, living room analogy, it, for me when I push the remote in my living room and the TV doesn't do exactly what I want it to do, I, I can look at the remote and keep pressing the button try to have it, have it do it over and over again. And that's the SDN controller. But at some point, there's something else going on in the living room, like potentially the box is no longer responsive. And that's where IMC comes in and can give the overall health of the network and determine beyond just basic control of the network what else is going on, what's the overall health and, and, um, and performance of my network. Excellent. And um, here I put co uh, Tom's contact information up here so that um, you can copy it down if you do have additional questions. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for taking their time out of the day to attend our webinar. And Tom, thank you so much for presenting. Um, and we will send out the recording after this call. I think that's it for today. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye.